God, please, and turn with me to the Gospel according to John, to the 10th chapter, and we'll begin reading in just a moment with verse 1 in John chapter 10. God helping me, I want to give three messages from this 10th chapter to do all I can to help and aid our people. While you're listening, I want to give you this verse, and I'd like you to write it down. In Proverbs chapter 27, the verse is verse 23. Proverbs 27, verse 23. God's word says, Be thou diligent to know the state of thy flocks, and look well to thy herds. So God says to the pastor or shepherd of the flock that we're to have diligence and to know and to look well to our flock. This is the purpose behind what I'm trying to do. God helping me, I'll give these three messages through the 10th chapter of the Gospel according to John. And then I'm going to add to that 31 different things that you won't hear, you can read if you wish. 31 different things that God says in his word about the shepherd. And I want to have those things available for you. Not just these three messages, but the 31 things God says about the shepherd in the Bible. Preferably, I'd like for you to meditate upon one of those each day of the week in a month and ask God to speak to us through them. May the Lord help me. John chapter 10, beginning with verse 1. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, and they know his voice. And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers." This parable spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they were which he spake unto them. Then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life. For the sheep. If you're in the habit of marking things in your Bible, I want you to mark this expression, would you please? It's in the 11th verse. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. So many years ago, when I came here to be the pastor of this church, many years ago now, I came with one intention, and that is to give my life for the sheep. I believe if the Lord doesn't come soon, and I'm I'm looking for his return every day, and believing that he's coming every day, and I love his appearing. I long to see him. I want to see him. The greatest day of my life will be the day that Jesus comes. If he doesn't come soon and I go through the door of death, the greatest day of my life will be the door of death day that I go through because I will see Jesus face to face. I learned to love him and follow him as a teenage boy. I've given all of my adult life 
to him. I said in a public meeting the other evening, speaking to politically interested people, I was invited to speak and to give a little speech about what I've recognized as going on in our city and county, some things to the detriment of our good. And I said, I want you to know something. I'm a pastor. I've been a pastor 54 years. I have no desire for any other office. I have no desire to be anything else. I just want to be a faithful pastor. That's it for me. That's the assignment that God has given me. There's no question in my mind about that. It's sure, it's certain, it's settled. God has called me to be an under-shepherd of our shepherd, an under-shepherd to the sheep. If I have to say to you, there's one thing that I've thought much about that is characteristic of our day, it is that we're going to have to deal with more deception in this spirit of the age than we've dealt with in the past. It is so important that we be discerning people. They were able to recognize the Lord. We were able to recognize God's spirit. The Bible teaches us, and I shall come to that near the conclusion of this message, that the Antichrist and the spirit of Antichrist is upon us. And he has every evil intention. And the worst thing that will be done will be the things that appear nearest to the truth but will not be the truth. So I'm praying for the flock where I serve as a shepherd and for any other place God may use me that we shall know the truth and be set free by that truth that we know. God guiding us. There's so much in this chapter of the Bible that we need to internalize because I've been over half a century serving as a pastor, a shepherd, and I've met so many people who cannot lead, they cannot lead, and they will not follow. These people are on the most dangerous ground imaginable because they open their lives to error. And the error that's most likely to take them or overtake them is the error that looks delightful, most like something truthful. But this kind of deception is a part of the spirit of our age. I'm not trying to say any of these things to you to get you to follow me. Honestly, God knows my heart. I believe that God has given me this charge. He has anointed me for this task. And if I serve the Lord in the power of his spirit, those who truly know him and follow him will understand that without me going into something trying to bang them over the head and say, you must do this. It's never been my way to say to you, I'm the pastor, you need to follow the pastor's leading. No. If I have to say that, then there's something wrong. I believe that God has given me an assignment and I want to be faithfully serving him in that assignment. And I want you to remember, I've had you mark this verse, verse 11. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. Of course, this is certainly about the Lord Jesus and how he came to die. He came to give himself a ransom. He taught us that nobody took his life from him. He laid it down of his own power. He took it up of his own power. It is about Christ. This chapter is all about Christ dealing with Christ and the shepherd that he is, the good shepherd. We shall find in other places in the word of God that he is the chief shepherd, that he is the great shepherd, but here he's the good shepherd. 
just for the refreshing of our souls, I want you to hold your place here and turn with me to the Psalms just for a moment. The Psalm 23, I want us to read it out loud. It's a little unusual for us, but I want you to have it there. We'll begin with Psalm 23 and verse 1. I want you to read it aloud with me. Together, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Notice verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd. If we studied about the Lord as the good shepherd, the Lord as the great shepherd, and the Lord as the chief shepherd, and you understood what passages of the scripture we dealt with and what the context and meaning of the passage happened to be. If you could not say from your heart, the Lord is my shepherd, it would all be in vain. The Lord is my shepherd. Can you say that? The Lord is my shepherd. What does that involve? What does all of that entail? The Lord is my shepherd. I've been thinking and meditating upon that expression. If he's truly my shepherd, I can say I shall not want. He knows my needs. He'll take care of me. He will guide me. He'll provide for me. No matter what's going on round about me, no matter how much spooky stuff the world talks about, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. No matter how many horror stories I may hear about what might happen to the earth or to God's people or to a particular geographical location in the world, if I can say truly the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. No matter what crisis may come upon me, health, financial, doesn't make any difference. If I can truthfully say the Lord is my shepherd, I can also say I shall not want. Can you say the Lord is my shepherd? If you're having the biggest problems in the world, and they're always the biggest problems in the world when they're your problems, nothing's real until it's personal. <laughs> If you can say, the Lord is my shepherd, you can also say, I shall not want. He's promised to be with us, to never leave us or forsake us. How do you know that? Because the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I give him all the praise and glory I can give him because he's my shepherd. I shall not want. Now, I want us to go back to the 10th chapter of the gospel according to John and let God speak to us. Let the Lord deal with us. I, I love the Lord. I can demonstrate that in my life. I think my deeds proving that are more powerful than my words saying it. I do love him, and I love his people, and in particular, I love this church. And I determined when I came here as a very young man to give my life for the sheep. And by God's grace, he's enabled me to do that. And I have no regrets. None. No regrets. I just want us to be everything that God has desired for us to be as a body of believers. I want this church to be the flock of God 
that he desires, as strong as it can possibly be. And as long, gives, as long as the Lord gives me the responsibility and privilege to be the shepherd of these sheep, you being the sheep and me being the shepherd, I want to give my promise to follow the Lord as close as I can and to guide this church. I believe God gives leadership through pastors. We say the Lord is our guide, and when we say that, the guidance is not as important as the guide. And the application of that is if a pastor is guiding a church and you say we, we're guided by our pastor and I believe that's a biblical statement then the guiding is not as important as the person doing the guiding who needs to be thoroughly right with God and you've been so patient and prayerful for me to let the Lord deal with me and guide me and help me and bring me to himself so I want us to see what we can get. I said to one of our men earlier, this is just the introduction I want to give. And it's hard for pastors to preach a sermon that's an introduction because they want to say the whole thing, unload the whole wagon, get to the bottom line, especially someone like me. They want to get at it. But let's begin with John chapter 10, verse 1. Would you write this down? We're going to deal with this beginning and what God says. As we look first at the audience to whom he speaks, the audience to whom he speaks. If we miss this, we're not going to understand what he's saying. The audience to whom Jesus speaks is found in the previous chapter. The previous chapter tells us about a man who was born blind, the Bible says in chapter 9 verse 20, born blind. And the Lord healed him. Never such a thing had happened. And when he demonstrated his sight, this man who had been born blind, the Pharisees were critical of him. They were the religious leaders. As a matter of fact, we take part of it in verse 25 of chapter 9. He answered and said, Whether he be a sinner or no, I know not. One thing I know that whereas I was blind, now I see. Then said they to him again, What did he to thee? How opened he thine eyes? He answered them, I have told you already. Sounds a little disgusted by now. And you did not hear. Wherefore would you hear it again? Will you also be his disciples? Then they reviled him and said, Thou art his disciple, but we are Moses' disciples. We know that God spake unto Moses, As for this fellow, we know not from whence he is. They're talking about the Lord Jesus. The man answered and said unto him, them, Why herein is a marvelous thing, that ye know not from whence he is, and yet he hath opened mine eyes. Now we know that God heareth not sinners, but if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth. Since the world began, was it not heard that any man openeth the eyes of one that was born blind? If this man were not of God, he could do nothing. They answered and said unto him, Thou wast altogether born in sins, and dost thou teach us? And they cast him out. Now that's enough. That's enough. Jesus knows what's going on, so that's why we read in the very next verse, Jesus heard that they had cast him out. And when he had found him, he said unto him, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? And he answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? And Jesus said unto him, Thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talketh with thee. And he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. 
Now, the fellow's in good shape. He now sees he was blind. He'd been blind all his life. He'd been abused by the religious leaders in his day. He'd been cast out. But he's all right with Jesus. He's now not only a man who can see physically, he's been born of God's spirit. He's been born again. But it doesn't stop there. In verse 40 it says, And some of the Pharisees which were with him heard these words and said unto him, Are we blind also? And Jesus said unto them, If ye were blind, ye would have no sin. But now ye say, we see, therefore your sin remaineth. And let's pass by the chapter and verse division for a moment and go right to the next verse. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. The audience to whom Jesus speaks is the audience of these Pharisees, these religious leaders. And when you read the Bible and study the life of Jesus Christ, you're going to find that the Lord is not harder on anyone, any more harder on anyone, not harder on anyone than he is on religious leaders who are hypocrites. So he begins to tell them this parable. And they understand Verily, verily, with this emphasis, verily, verily, it's almost like, listen, listen, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. Now, here's the setting. Every shepherd knew, everyone who was familiar with sheep knew what he was talking about. There's a sheepfold in a certain community. It's been prepared so that people who are taking care of their sheep, there may be many shepherds, to get rest for the night would bring their sheep to a, to a sheepfold, to a place that's built on three sides so that the sheep from each shepherd's flock can come into the sheepfold and be cared for for the night while the shepherd goes to get his rest. Then someone, we'll get his name in a moment, someone actually makes himself the door to that sheepfold by lying or placing his body right across and all the sheep are inside. There are walls protecting the sheep and there is a porter, God says, guarding the door. Now it's possible not particularly likely, but possible that someone could climb one of the walls unbeknowing to the porter if he's not doing his job and attack the sheep. It's possible that an animal could do that or another person could do that. And Jesus is telling them this story and they know the details. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. The shepherd comes in the morning and he tells what he does. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and leads them out. Now isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? You may be an animal lover. I happen to be one, so I don't like to hear cruelty to animal stories. I've said that to you so many times through the years. That nobody tells me their jokes about mistreating cats or dogs. I just don't want to hear it. But anyway... You could come to a place where there are animals and if your particular pet is with those animals, your pet, your animal, recognizes you above all the other people. So you get the story here. The shepherd loves his sheep and he comes now after a night's rest and he comes to the porter who's been watching the sheep and he has been the, the human door protecting them and he comes to get his sheep. And the Bible says when the sheep see him and hear his voice, they're excited. You ever seen a pet get excited? They're excited, they recognize him. And so they hear his voice and he calleth his own, his own sheep by name and leadeth them out and they follow him. The other sheep don't follow him, they'll follow their own shepherd. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them 
and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And he adds to this, and a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. Notice carefully in verse 6, this parable, this story, spake Jesus unto them. Them, connected with the you, verily, verily, I say unto you, connected with the criticizers in chapter 9 tells us the audience for this parable, the audience for this story, the audience to whom Jesus is talking are these religious leaders who claim to lead people. They claim to be providing the leadership that the people need or will follow. And I've said to you many times, you know, you may be a leader without being a shepherd, but you cannot be a shepherd without being a leader. And so the Lord is battling something. He's calling his sheep from among the people who are following these leaders of Judaism. He calls them out one by one. They're his sheep. And the Bible says, this parable spake Jesus unto them. And what God is doing in this world is calling out a people for his name. Something has happened to you if you've been born again. If you've truly been born again, you're indwelt by the Holy Spirit. That's different from the rest of the world. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Jesus Christ lives in you. And you recognize when God's word has been spoken, when God's man is speaking it, when the teaching of God's word goes out, and you will not follow just a stranger you follow the voice of God's word and the spirit of God bears witness in your spirit that you're one of God's children. This isn't just some sort of rote memory or practice of something or lining up people. There is a deep spiritual thing going on in your life when God speaks to you. There's an affirmation that the Holy Spirit gives. I want you to write down a second thing. That's the aim that Jesus has. Notice again verse 6. This parable spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they were which he spoke unto them. Jesus spoke it, and they didn't get it. Can you imagine, as much as those of you who know the Lord, love the Lord, and want to follow the Lord, and want to obey the Lord, meaning the Lord Jesus, that he's speaking to a group here, and his aim is to teach them, and to call out from among them those who hear his voice and know him, but they don't understand it. They're blind and lost in their sin. You and I are living in a blind world that's blind spiritually. And sometimes you say things like this, and I say things like this. I don't know why they don't get it. They just don't get it. They don't see it. They don't get it. Because it's of a spiritual nature. It's something having to do with Christ and his word. And they're blind to it. I want to hold your place here. Let's turn to the gospel according to Matthew just a moment. I want you just to see how serious Christ is about religious era. So you and I don't get this serious, but we should. How many churches there are in our community? How many people say they're identified with some religious group? I want you to see how serious Christ is about religious era. In the 23rd chapter of the gospel according to Matthew, Jesus preaches a scathing sermon. As a matter of fact, nothing in the Bible is harder than this sermon. You may want to mark this word woe, which means destruction. The Bible says in chapter 23 and verse 13, but woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut up the kingdom of heaven 
against the men. For ye neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. In other words, there are people in leadership that God says you're headed for destruction. Not only are you a hypocrite as a leader pretending to be something you're not, but other people are going to hell because of you. Verse 14, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you devour widows' houses for a pretense, make long prayer. Therefore you shall receive the greater damnation. I just can't stand to hear people pray and use some other voice to God like they're trying to impress somebody about how holy they are, how religious they are, how much they know about God. And God says, I've listened to your prayers long enough. And they're all the prayers of hypocrites. Woe unto you, destruction unto you. Verse 15, woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For ye can pass sea and land to make one proselyte. And when he is made, he you make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. In other words, people who are following this and believing this that's not true and making a religion alongside biblical faith that's not biblical faith, but it's something to deceive people. God, the Lord Jesus says, you're making them twofold more a child of hell. I'm talking about how serious he is about religious hypocrisy. And he says, you'll pass land and sea to do it. Verse 16, woe unto you, ye blind guides, which say, whosoever shall swear by the temple, it is nothing. But whosoever shall swear by the gold of the temple, he is a debtor. They've made their own set of rules. Blind guides. Think of those two words, blind guides. Look again, if you would, please. What the Lord keeps saying, woe unto you, woe unto you, you fools and blind. He says, verse 19, you fools and blind. And then he says in verse 23, woe unto you scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and omit the weightier matters of the law. In other words, we should be pay, paying tithe, but but you think that gets you by with the weight of your matters that you've... Then in verse, says, verse 24, you blind guides would strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. Verse 25, woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you make clean the outside of the cup of the platter, but within you are full of extortion and excess. God help us. Verse 27, woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like unto white-watered sepulchers, whited sepulchers, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones. Now, can you imagine Jesus Christ preaching this, not just out in the air, but face to face with people? Verse 29, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you build the tombs of prophets and garnish the scepters of the sepulchers of the righteous and say, if we had been in the days of our fathers. We would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Wherefore, ye be witnesses unto yourselves that ye are the children of them which kill the prophets. It says in verse 33, ye serpents, ye generation of vipers, how can ye escape the damnation of hell? Did you ever hear such a sermon? I'm saying to you, did you ever hear such a sermon? Why would Jesus preach such a sermon? Because he was so disturbed by people propagating error, religious people propagating error that was religious but not of God. And so now he's speaking to these Pharisees who condemn this poor man who just got healed of his blindness, couldn't rejoice, couldn't rejoice, just be critical, couldn't rejoice. He aimed at them. 
but they didn't get it. And there's some of you who need to be asking God, are things aimed at me I don't get? Am I really understanding the things of God? Then I want you to see a third thing. And that is, again, he spoke. I don't know, I don't quite understand this. I want to say, let's just give up on the crowd. But the Bible says in verse 7, Then said Jesus unto them again. Would you mark that little word? Again. Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. I am the door. And he goes on to explain all of this. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers. The word thieves and the word robbers has a, a deep meaning from the root word it comes from. It has to do with doing something by deceit and doing something with violence. By deceit. Slipping around. Sneaking around. Thieves. To do you harm. Robbers. But the sheep did not hear them. I am the door by me. If any man enter in, he shall be saved. And shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief cometh not. This deceiver cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life, that they might have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. The Lord Jesus came to bleed and die for our sins. He paid your debt and my debt is it hard for you to understand that what God is doing, Satan is always building a counterfeit to whatever God is doing? Alongside it, near it, a counterfeit? And you may even say of something, that looks like a good idea. What's the harm in that? These are days when we must be as discerning as we can possibly be. I think I shall wait, but I want to give you a passage that I intended to get to about the Antichrist who's coming and what his characteristics will be. But this I know for sure, for certain. The Lord Jesus Christ came to earth and became a man without ceasing to be God. To be robed in flesh, incarnate, the word means robed in flesh, incarnate so that he could go in that body to the cross and bleed and die for our sins. You see, if you don't get that, you don't get anything about God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You and I have a terrible sin debt. We're sinners and our debt must be paid. And God so loved us that he gave his only begotten son to pay our debt the issue is not a bad habit or, you know, something that you might excuse with some other language or word. The issue is sin has separated us from God and the payment of our sin is death and hell. Jesus went to the cross and paid it all. That's why the songwriter was right. The songwriter was right when he said, and all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, but he washed it white as snow. I'm so thankful this moment that I'm one of God's sheep, that he is my shepherd. And I want the sheep that he's given us and the flock that he's given us to be alert, wide awake, ready to receive his word, to love him and to love the church he suffered, bled, and died for. Get that. Get it. Do you love him? Do you love what he loves? Are you one of his sheep? 
Let's bow in prayer, may we?